Hey, so when I first started uh, doing photo and video stuff, I watched probably a thousand hours of YouTube content and I'd go on Reddit and see, you know, what people were asking and answering and learning and all that kind of stuff. So I figured I'd go online and see what people are asking these days and give some unsolicited advice to strangers who didn't ask me specifically for it. Um, here we go. Can I use polarizing filters all the time? You can use them all the time. You can do whatever you want. Sometimes there's consequences to your actions, but you could do whatever you want to in life. No, oh, no. Now, polarizing filters are something that I use seldomly, very infrequently, but I do carry them in my pack with me in case I need to shoot through like a car windshield or sometimes water, but mostly not. But they do help to kind of cut through those reflections and help with some of the highlights and stuff. I think you'll find with landscapes, if you use a polarizing filter, you will run into some streaky looking skies because the light in the sky isn't evenly distributed. So it's not like looking at like sun reflections and water. It's a little bit different. So you might run into some issues with that. With portraits, you will find that it is darker, so you're gonna have to adjust for that. And also a quote that stuck with me throughout the years is something along the lines of, you know, you buy expensive glass only to put a cheap piece of plastic on the front. So when you buy a very cheap, uh, or some sometimes even expensive polarizers, you will find that there is some color cast and some quality loss in it. You know, you're spending like, five, six, seven, hundred, a thousand, two thousand dollars on a lens, and then you, you know, you put a $20 filter in front of it, sometimes you are compromising on the quality of your image in those cases, so. Answered, how to achieve this editing look? Attached picture. I mean, this is one of the easier things. So really, this is just like a slightly soft, neutrally lit portrait in a white studio. So find yourself a white backdrop, get a flash, point your flash up slightly off to one side because I can see a slightly directional shadow so it's not perfectly coming from above and just adjust your settings as, uh, as needed in the camera there. And then in editing, uh, you're probably gonna wanna bring up the shadows a little bit and then you're gonna wanna add some grain probably. Looks like there's a little bit of grain after. Sometimes that helps soften it up, gives it a bit of a look. Uh, something like this. And that's how I would approach that one. On to the next question. A courthouse wedding. When I shoot photo, I always use a 35 and an 85. It allows me to get pretty much everything that I need. And uh, I love the depth of field that an 85 brings as well. Um, however, in a courtroom with a 50, you might be too, too tight. So I would probably run the 35. Um, if it's bright enough, if there's windows in the courtroom, you might be able to get away with the 24 to 105, which will gives you lots of different options uh, with your framing. Um, but the 35 would be my gut go to not have any clue what camera you're using. Especially if you're on like a crop sensor, I would probably avoid the 50 in that case. Answer. Why does opening iPhone photos in Windows 11 Photos app editor ruin the color? Because Windows sucks. <gasps> I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm a Windows user and uh, I, have, I have an Android telephone, not, uh, not an iPhone because I'm a commoner. Yeah, this is kind of the thing. I don't know if you've ever shot a photo on your camera and you look at it on the screen and then when you import it into something like Lightroom, it all of a sudden looks really different. That's because different color profiles exist on different devices and programs. Most commonly, at least in my experience, has been on like DSLR and mirrorless cameras. If you have some sort of creative look that's applied to the photo, your camera is only reading like the JPEG preview of that photo. So once you import the raw into your uh, Lightroom, 
that is gone. So then you're just left with the raw photo, which doesn't have any of the creative profile look on it. And you're like, well, it looked really good in camera, but now it kind of looks like shite. And um, yeah, it's because those adjustments don't apply to the raw photo. In this, I would imagine it's something to do with the color profiles that each system is using. And so I would try to save as a raw file or as strictly a JPEG uh, to get those colors compressed into the image with your phone and then bring it in. But see if you can shoot raw. I think Apple does that, right? I don't, I don't know. Answered. Can I get fisheye vignette with any fisheye lens? I'm new into photography, been shooting sporadically for maybe a year or a bit longer. I have always loved the vignette effect that fisheye lenses have. Okay, and I'm thinking about purchasing one. Hmm, this is interesting. I, I'm not known of fisheyes to have a specific type of vignette. They definitely can have that kind of blown out effect, but a specific vignette. So they've been looking at an eight millimeter 3.5. I've you I used to have a lens that was really similar. It was like a six and a half mil, which was crazy. You can add things like lens hoods, step up rings, all those stuff. You might have a hard time fitting it because most of the fisheye lenses that I've experienced have a weird flowered hood and it's tough to fit things on the outside. Personally, I would just add that in post. Uh, it's really easy and you can add a vignette in pretty much any photo software after like 1990. So um, I would just add it in editing and that way you're not stuck with it burned into the images. You can add it on images that you feel need it and you can not add it to images that you feel don't need it because not every image is the same and we'll use the same editing. So that's, that's that. Answer. How to shoot group shots with bokeh effect. Is it possible with Sigma 17 to 50 lens f 2.8? No. <laughs> of course. Uh, this is one of the first lenses that I got when I was first upgrading my lenses back many years ago. And so there's a few things that I would try. You want to maximize your depth of field. So if you can get your subjects far away from your backdrop, that's a good start because already you're gonna get more blur, more bokeh with your lens. Um, you're also gonna wanna try to get yourself away from your subject and zoom all the way into 50 mils because with that, you're gonna bring the background a lot closer and it's gonna still have that depth of field. It's gonna feel a lot more blurred and you're gonna get that effect that you're looking for. Now, the other thing, is to try to keep your aperture probably, depending on the size of the group and if everyone's in a straight line, probably around something like f4. If you shoot at f2.8, you may find that some people that are like slightly off axis or if they're like off to the side, they may be a bit blurry. Um, so try f4, double check in camera. It never hurts just to like take a quick look and make sure it's perfect in camera. But those would be my tips for that. Answer. Why do my photos not look crisp when they're in focus? That's a squirrel. That's a close a squirrel. That's a bench. So this is kind of one of the things where it's like, hey, the settings are pretty bang on. I mean, like F7 is like, pretty high, but you know, when you're zoomed in so far, sometimes it's tough to find lenses that will do, um, you know, lower than F four and a half type thing. Um, but this is kind of like one of the unfortunate realities with photography is that this is probably a lens quality issue. Um, when I first started photography, I also had the 75 to 300 or something along those lines. And I think like brand new, they're about 120 to $200, like some, somewhere in that range. And it's just, the quality just isn't there. Um, 
for whatever reason, like the glass is cheap or it's not optimized in the barrel distortion or something um, is going on where you can get a tack sharp shot where you know that if you shot that on like a G Master 70 to 200 lens, like that thing would be banging. But the optical quality and the glass quality sometimes in the cheaper lenses just like isn't quite there. And sometimes that's really nice when we're taking like certain kinds of portraits, if they're like a little bit artsy, or if we're doing like more of a wide shot, like it's a lot harder to notice the imperfections. But when we get up on something, um, that's when you start to notice. And if these things are bothering you, then it might be time to save up for an upgrade, try to get something used. I think I got my first like F4 7200 lens for like $1,400, um, which is like, you know, a bit cheaper than what they are brand new. But yeah, some something to think about. This is kind of where it's like it, if you're doing a lot of this and this really makes you happy, then it, it might be time to look at an upgrade. Really overwhelmed on picking up a lens. Which one should I buy? I don't know. For me, th I mean, this question comes up a lot. Like what's the first lens I should buy after the kit lens? I'm gonna assume this person has the kit lens. I don't wanna, I don't wanna be too bold here. I'm gonna go on a limb and say they have the kit lens. Um, personally for me, I had a 50 mil and I never used it. With the crop, that's coming out at about 75 millimeters. And that's pretty tight for like most things, especially starting out as a photographer when you're like taking pictures of plants and your friends and like things that are relatively close to your vicinity in like the same room. When you're just like testing stuff out and seeing kind of what sticks. Personally, the biggest game changer for me was when I bought a 17 to 50 mil lens that was f 2.8 all the way through, that really changed the way that I saw photography. I was able to take more control of my aperture. Um, the lighting was a lot better than being like, you know, 3.5 to 5.6 or whatever the range is on, on most kit lenses. And it just felt like higher quality glass. So the photos all of a sudden, same photos that I was taking with the kit lens, I would take with this new lens and they just felt automatically like a higher quality. And so that would be my recommendation. After that, if you do find your thing that you're passionate about, if you like shooting portraits, or if you like shooting landscapes, or if you like shooting whatever, then you can specialize. So if you like shooting portraits, look at like for a crop sensor, maybe like a 35 mil lens, something that's a little bit like higher quality with like a lower, maybe like a 1.4 aperture or something like that. If you love landscapes, that type of thing. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a 35 guy through and through. I use that for almost everything, but uh, landscapes, a lot of people like a 24. If you like street photography, sometimes if you want a wide lens, go with like a pancake lens or like, if you want to get shooting birds, then get a nice zoom lens. But figuring things out on a 17 to 50, that's 2.8 all the way through. It's just much nicer than figuring things out on the kit lens. And that's my best recommendation for this particular thing. So that's a lot of questions to go through. Um, hopefully maybe you were thinking the same thing and had similar questions and thus were helped by this video and maybe not. And you were just watching for some silliness, but uh, thanks for stopping by and um, Till next time, bye.